We're going to finish this morning the book of Ephesians. So if you would turn your way there in the Bible or pull it up on your phone, that would be great. If this is your first morning here in the series, um, that's not so bad. I'll catch you up quickly and remind us all of what we've been talking about over the past number of weeks. We're considering the reality that though God has perfect and very good plans and purposes for all of creation, uh, those plans and purposes are not only undermined by the fallen condition, like the sinful condition of the world, they are actively opposed by the evil one, the adversary, the devil, Satan. Satan is not little or red nor chubby with a white face. He doesn't carry a pitchfork or have horns. There is a real enemy for your souls that is ruthless and conniving. Jesus said when he lies, he speaks his native language. There is no truth in him. Jesus said that he has come to steal and kill and destroy, and he's masterful at it. The evil one is relentless. There is an enemy for your soul. Not only is he trying to rob your soul of eternal life, He is also wanting to rob your soul of the plans and the purposes of God being fulfilled in your life. So whether you are one who is currently apart from faith in Christ and the enemy is winning in the battle for your soul, or whether you're one who has become a follower of Jesus, that's to whom the book of Ephesians is written, maybe you're a follower of Christ who lives under the faulty notion that you automatically experience the plans and the purposes of God for your life. You don't. Life doesn't get played out in a vacuum. The effect of gravity on life and on your soul is not an increase in godliness. Though the Holy Spirit is relentlessly moving you towards God's goodness and His purposes, your participation in them is directly related to what Paul will go on to say, your faithfulness to equip yourself with the armor that God provides. The evil one seeks to take life God works to give life. So for those who are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is given. And then Paul reminds us by imagery of armor of what we need to do to actively engage the real war for our souls and God's purposes in this life. So he points to practical ways that you put on Jesus. The answer to how you experience increasingly God's plans and purposes for your life is to understand how to put on Jesus like the armor. So he likens it to a belt. That's the first piece. He says, put on belt. Put on belt. That's what he says. Put on belt. It like truth. Put on belt. It like truth. Hold everything together. And then he says, put on a breastplate of righteousness. Your obedience Your your faithfulness to God and his word, it protects you from all kinds of garbage in life, like a chest protector does. And then he reminds us that we should put on gospel readiness. If you are a child of God, he's given you work to do in the world. Our work is not only just to hunker down from the devil and keep him from killing us. It is to move out into the world with the message of peace with the gospel. That's what the world needs. The world doesn't need legislation. The world needs the good news that God offers life and forgiveness to all who would receive it, who then can participate in the work that God is doing to one day make all things new. And then the last three sets, the last three pieces of armor go together. So he says, take up the shield of faith, put on the helmet of salvation, get yourself a sword, It's the word of God. And with those things, pray. That doesn't sound very warlike. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. The battle plays out in the world of flesh and blood, but it's ultimately against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And you don't fight a spiritual battle with a literal weapon With a sword, you fight a spiritual battle with a metaphorical sword, the word of God, by prayer. We said last week that prayer is what connects us to the power of God to accomplish his purposes. So the final bit of instruction that the Apostle Paul has in his letter to the believers at Ephesus is to stay awake. 
Some of you find the sermon as a wonderful time to get a little nap. This morning, I'm going to scour the room and look for the snoozers because the point of the sermon is stay awake. (laughs) So we better have a short sermon, huh? All right, this is what we'll read together in the book of Ephesians. Would you join me there? Chapter 6, verse 10. We'll read this section for the last time in this series. This is the word of God. May he bless those who hear his word and believe his word. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm." Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. We'll focus in first on verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, for the end of prayer and maintaining a connection to God. Keep alert with all perseverance. Prayer, we talked about this last week by way of a metaphor. Prayer is how you plug into the power of God to accomplish His purposes. We liken this to an appliance. Who cares how large your refrigerator is, how shiny your refrigerator is, who cares that it can give you water and ice, cubed and crushed? Who cares if it has an LCD, LED screen that can give you the news and the weather report? Who cares if you can Bluetooth connect it to your smartphone or your Alexa? Who cares about any of that if it's not plugged in? If it has no power, it's just a really expensive rectangle taking up space in your kitchen. It must be plugged in. If you are a Christian that does not pray, I would suggest to you, you are a Christian that is not plugged into the power of God to accomplish His purposes in your life. You could put on the armor of God, presumably, and if you're not connected to God in prayer, well, then you will not experience God's plans and purposes for your life. Like the refrigerator that must be plugged in, or the microwave, or the toaster. So you must be plugged in through prayer to the power of God. That's how you access the power of God through the ordinary, Lord willing, every day, and unceasing connection to God through prayer. So he says, because we are to be people who are plugged into the power of God by prayer, we do this with all prayer for all the saints, all the time. He says we ought to do it, in verse 18, to keep alert with all perseverance. To keep alert It's the same Greek word to stay awake. It's used a handful of times in the New Testament. One of the most well-known times is this occasion that I'll bring back to your minds. On the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus in the coming days will be crucified and then laid in the tomb and then resurrected, he tells all of the disciples that you're all going to fall away because of me this night. Peter opens up his mouth and inserts his foot by saying, I don't care what these men do, I will not fall away from you. Jesus corrects him and says, actually, Peter, um, tonight, 
before morning comes, you're going to deny that you know me three times. And Peter says, no way. I'm willing to die with you. And all the other disciples are like, yeah, me too. So Jesus moves towards the garden. He asks the disciples to pray with him. He takes Peter, James, and John. These are no slouches. Peter, James, and John, the cream of the crop. And he says, hey, you men, stay here. Stay here and keep watch with me. Stay alert with me. Stay awake with me. Jesus leaves them. He comes over here and he prays. And he pleads with God the Father for another way to redeem mankind. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, and he is confronted now with the reality of what it will cost him. Not just death on a cross, rejection from his Father. And so he pleads for another way. When God says no, which Jesus knew would happen, he resolves himself eagerly to pursue the road of God's will for his life through the cross. He comes back to the disciples. This is audience participation time. He comes to the disciples and he finds them problematic. Doesn't tell us how Jesus woke them up. I think that's interesting to think about. Jesus comes and he finds them sleeping and somehow he rouses Peter. I don't know if he, you know, taps his foot, it just stands there and somehow looks at him and Peter feels the weight of his, I don't know. Peter wakes up and he says, could you not keep watch with me for one hour? He says, watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. Now that's interesting. Watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation because Jesus isn't going to fall into temptation and why not? Because Jesus goes back, and now a second time, Jesus is praying. If it's true for Jesus that he connects into, he plugs into the power of God for God's purposes in his life, Jesus is praying. Are you going to fare better as a child of God without prayer? Why would you think such a thing? Why would we take prayer so flippantly or so casually, if you're not a follower of Christ who prays, that is a major problem. How do you imagine you're going to experience God's plan and purposes for your life? Well, you want to be a refrigerator that cools food without ever being plugged in. That doesn't even make any sense. Jesus is so intense in prayer. Luke says it's like sweat, like drops of blood fell from his face. This is Jesus who is laboring in prayer to stay awake, to be alert, to persevere. The second time he prays, now he comes back a second time to the disciples. Audience participation time. He comes back and he finds the disciples. I mean, isn't that just so fallen human being? Please don't believe the lie that at some point in your life, you don't really pray a whole lot now, but you know that you should. It's just a discipline you haven't developed, but you know you should. Don't believe the lie that when life gets really serious, all of a sudden you will then become diligent in prayer. You don't think the disciples knew the gravity of this moment? Jesus told them plainly, He's going to die. He asked them to keep watch with him. He pleaded with them so that they wouldn't fall into temptation. And they're sleeping. I can relate to that. You can relate to that if you're honest. We just fall asleep on the plans and purposes of God in our life. We get distracted. We grow disinterested. We grow weary. We just fall asleep on the job praise to God. Jesus doesn't. He goes back a third time, prays again, pleading with God the Father for another way. The Father says no, and Jesus resolves to go through the cross. 
the author of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Don't feel sorry for Jesus. This is a warrior king who said, yes, Father, I will do what you have asked me to do. This is the purpose for which you have sent me to the earth, and I will do it. And so he sets his resolve to go through the cross, and he does. And he comes back, third time now, he comes back to the disciples, and he finds them. We were building momentum there. Did I not set you up very well for that? Disciples sleeping. Jesus praying. Round two. Disciples. Jesus. Third time now. Third time. Jesus is praying and he finds the disciples. I don't even know what you do with that. The fact that Jesus doesn't just whoop them something serious. I mean, wouldn't you at least want to like pop them in the chest one time? Something. So Jesus rouses them a third time, and this is what he says to them. Sleep and take your rest later on. The hour is at hand. The time is now. If you are a child of God, you can sleep for all eternity. You will rest for all eternity. All the plans and the purposes of God will be accomplished for all eternity. For now, stay awake, be alert, be engaged, participate. It is so easy for us to be distracted and to fall asleep. It was for the very first followers of Jesus, and I think it will be until Christ returns. When Jesus taught the parable of the soils, he likened people's hearts to soil. He said there will be four kinds. The gospel will be spread all over the earth. Some people are like a soil that actually isn't even soil. It's like a concrete path. The seed falls on it. The birds come down. That's the evil one and just eat it up. Just hearts as hard as stone. Some people are a little bit softer. Their heart is actually kind of like soil, but it's a shallow soil. It, it has rocks up at the surface. So it warms quickly and like, ooh, they get excited about God for a short season. But then life gets hard. Jesus allows them to experience trial and hardship. Jesus doesn't swoop down in and rescue them from every difficulty of life and they're like, ah, this isn't for me. They fall away. A third group, I think um, Christians in America are particularly vulnerable to be this kind of soil. We can have hearts that seem to eagerly receive the word of God, seem to follow him, but yet we never produce fruit. Jesus said, that this kind of soil is like soil that has thorns growing up in it. He said, as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Jesus said elsewhere, it's like the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. Many of you have planted gardens again this year, vegetable gardens, and you have been reminded, this is your annual reminder, that weeds are everywhere. I think they're a product of the fall, certainly the ones that you can't eat or look pretty. They just wreak havoc in your garden. So the plants that you have planted, if they don't grow up and produce fruit, what kind of plant is that? A mostly worthless plant. It's so easy to be distracted. In a culture like ours, we're not... We're not uniquely tempted to be distracted, but I think what we experience in our culture is a pronounced distraction by material riches and ease and comfort. What are the things in your life that you find yourself prone to be distracted by? Distracted from the purposes and the plans of God for which you need his power to accomplish, I might humbly submit to you, this is why 
many Christians don't have a robust life in prayer. To experience God's plans and purposes for your life, you have to pray. If you're not connected to the power of God, they're not happening. Do you know how much prayer is required to live a distracted life? Yeah, that much. None. You don't have to pray. You don't have to be connected to the power of God to become distracted in your faith. To believe that life is about the acquisition of goods or about building a legacy at work or building a big retirement or acquiring stuff, that doesn't require prayer to do any of that. It's easy to be distracted. I don't know that it's going to do you any good to beat yourself up for it or take on a burden of shame. I would feel guilt if you would assess yourself as being really distracted by the things of this world that take you away from the purposes and plans of God. If that's you, then just confess that and then wake yourself up. Let this morning wake you up and return to God. Plug in to the power of God for His plans and purposes in your life. In Matthew, Jesus taught about distraction and staying awake. He says, be on guard, keep awake. You do not know when the time will come, referring to his second coming. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. You do not know when the master of the house will come. Don't tell yourself, sometime future in life, I'll get really serious about God. I'll get really serious about my faith. As though God is going to say to you, one month left, people. One month left. Do you know what would happen if God said one month left? A whole lot of people would be like, sweet, I got about 30 more days before I get serious. He, he tells us to, to be alert and awake now. Now is the time. Rest, sleep, that's later. This is the time for work. Stay awake, he says. You don't know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Awake to the purposes and the plans of God, which I think we are reminded of in the way that Paul closes his letter. So let's go on. I want to consider the rest of the letter this morning. Let's look first at what Paul requests he be prayed for. Paul wants to be prayed for. So he tells believers, pray for all the saints. And to those in Ephesus at the time, he also says to them, pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Don't miss the fact that Jesus prays for himself and asks his friends to pray for him. The Apostle Paul prays for himself and asks for others to pray for him. It's something like eight times in the New Testament Paul asks for or commands people that he's writing to to pray for him. If Jesus prays for himself and asks others to pray for him, and if Paul does the same, ought we not, likewise, to pray for ourselves and ask others to pray for us? A faithful life in Christ is a life of dependence upon God. We need his power. We should ask him for it. Ask others to pray for us. And then look at what Paul prays for, that words would be given to him in opening his mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. I think there is um, a specific encouragement to Paul and others who are mouths in the body of Christ, and then a more general one. I think Paul asks for boldness and words to speak because he's a mouthpiece. If we're all parts of Jesus' body metaphorically on earth, not everybody's a mouth. I'm a mouth. I'm no Apostle Paul. He's like the mouth. He's like the mouth of all mouths. So he prays, like, help me be a mouth. Like, help God. No, help, help me help you. 
pray for God to give me words to be a mouth, because I'm a mouth, and then help me have courage in speaking those words. That's a wonderful prayer to pray, even for yourself. But I think Paul is specifically having in mind, God has gifted him as a mouth. So God, use the gifts you have given me. Help me. Use the gifts you've given me for your purposes, which is, now here's the general, I think, encouragement to all who are in Christ, to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. I think this brings back to our minds, I wonder if Paul had it in his mind, the, the mission that Jesus gave to the church. This is you if you are a follower of Christ. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And don't forget, I'm with you until the very end. This is the work that God has given the church to do. As you consider the plan and the purposes that God has for your life, I absolutely assure you, if you are in Christ, then part of God's plan and purpose for your life is that you use the gifts God has given you to make Christ known in the world. Now, you're not all mouths. You're not all elbows. We are all different parts. And together, the church, us as the body of Christ, announces the gospel to the world. This ought to be our loudest message. If you live a life as a Christian and you do not in any meaningful way participate in making the gospel known, either by your giving, by your words, by your prayer, then I would say to you, you are falling asleep on one of God's primary purposes for you. The gospel, the good news, is what he's given to the church. There is no president in the world, no prime minister, no politician that can offer to mankind the truth that though we are enslaved by sin, born into it from the wombs of our mothers, there is a deliverance offered by God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. We should certainly have laws that work towards the well-being of others. Absolutely, no law saves a person from their sin. Our hope as the church is in God, and the gospel is the answer that God has given us to the problem of sin. There should be some who work in the public arena, who work in politics to advocate for just laws and the undoing of wicked laws. But our hope is not in legislation nor in a political figure. We have a president. His name is Jesus. He has given instruction to the church on what we ought to do now. The time is now. The work is now. So we stay awake. We stay alert. We persevere with the gospel. Let us make sure, if you count yourself a Christian, that what you are moving into the world with is the message of the gospel. Not only moving into the world with an eagerness to identify sin where you see it and evil where you see it, but with the gospel. This is the work that God has uniquely given to the church to do. So when Paul is asking people to pray for him, he says... Pray that I would use the gifts God has given me to make God known in the world. And then I think we get a reminder in how Paul refers to himself. I think we get a reminder of our own identity as Christians. He says in verse 20, For which I am an ambassador in chains. There's some irony there that Paul is an ambassador, one who is sent and he's currently confined. Interesting. Paul is arguably the most effective mouthpiece for King Jesus that the world has ever seen. And he lived in a time without the internet. I say praise God for that. I wish I could go back to that time. Think about that. The most effective mouthpiece, I think, in all of the history of Christendom lived in the time before technology, and he's currently 
chained to a Roman soldier. Interesting. That probably reminded him that he needed to pray, that he needed God's power to accomplish God's purposes. Because what kind of a herald can't travel around? What kind of a messenger is going to be constrained in getting the message out? I think it's interesting to consider that Paul taught earlier in Ephesians, I wonder how he learned this in his own life, that God's power is made perfect in his weakness. That's a pretty compelling weakness if you're a messenger that can't move around. Now, he is an ambassador in chains, in chains literally to a Roman soldier most likely, but I also think it gives us a glimpse. I don't know if this was in Paul's mind, but I think it does give us a glimpse on how we would do well to understand our own identity in the time of the world that God has placed us. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus said, stay alert, be awake, persevere. And I think when Paul says, I'm an ambassador in chains, he's not just referring to Roman imprisonment. He sees himself in a fallen world that is spiritually contested, not getting all the blessings and the benefits and the privileges of being a child of God. Those are all later. So Paul could render himself with great joy. Though he is in chains, he is an ambassador for Christ because I think he has ordered his whole life around his identity as a child of God and God's purposes and plans that he uses Paul for. Let's look at the rest of the book. I want to... I want to frame this for you by this is the work that God is doing. These are some of the outworkings of the plans and the purposes of God, which in my mind are an incredible motivation to keep going. It's worth it. Like, stay awake. Why should you stay awake if you can just float through life and wait for Jesus to come back? Because you miss out on the point of your calling. You are made for something. Jesus said, I brought glory to you, Father, by doing the work you gave me to do. If you are a follower of Christ, there is work to do. Don't sleep on Jesus. Stay awake because God is doing wonderful and incredible things. So Paul ends the letter with this benediction. Let's read first verses 21 and 22. I just feel like we need to read them, then we can say we did the whole book. I don't know if that's worth anything, but humor me. So that you all say, may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus. Does anybody have a child named Tychicus? Perhaps we should. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose. These are Paul's friends. He knew them and loved them, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Now how he closes in a benediction that brings back to our mind some of the wonderful things God is doing in the world and will one day complete. He says, peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Peace be to the brothers and to the sisters. Peace to all who are in Christ. Peace is the way things ought to be, to be right with God. I mean, God is making people right with himself. As a Christian, you have been made right with God by the gospel, and then now you're given the message that makes people right with God and with each other. Peace, he says to us, and love with faith. Three times he repeats love. Um, many of you know in, in 1 Corinthians and the chapter on love, he says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. I think it's a way by mentioning it three times. Love, this is what God is pouring into the world from God. Peace and love with faith from God. 
These things come from God. Ultimately, God is love, and love comes from Him. God is peace. Peace comes from Him. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit already indwells a believer. I wonder if that's why he doesn't mention it here. Grace. What would we have from God if he wasn't gracious? God is bringing peace to the world, love to the world, faith to the world, grace to the world. Can we be Christians that bring these things to the world? I mean, grace is God's unmerited favor. That means you didn't earn it. Let's not be people who see sin in others around us and sin in our culture and not be people who speak a message of grace. We should do both. We should be the kind of people that the culture around us doesn't exactly know how to categorize. We should not be people who align ourselves so lockstep with any one political party and forsake the teaching in the truth of Christ. We should be willing to call a spade a spade. Nope, that is sin. This is God's design for gender. This is God's desire for sexuality. This is God's design for money. This is God's design to care for the poor and the marginalized. This is God's design to care for the refugee and the orphan among you. The world should look at us and not not exactly know what to do with us because we should speak the truth in love. And sin is rampant in our world and in every fallen human heart, and we should be willing to say that in love and then offer the same grace that you have received if you are in Christ. Jesus didn't offer you grace because you were somehow a less severe sinner. Jesus offered you grace in spite of the severity of your sin. Let us not be Christians that are more known for how upset we get about sin in the world around us. And for sure, do not be a person online who blasts sin that you see around you. The world doesn't need that. Yes, call sin, sin in the right time and in the right place. And then louder than you say the word sin, louder than you say sin, say God is gracious and he invites you to repent from your sin to receive his love and his forgiveness. The Apostle Paul saw God's grace in his life as an incredible testimony that if God could be gracious to me, God will be gracious to you. Are you so convinced that God has been so insanely gracious to you that it motivates you to offer that grace to others? This is the work that the church does. So don't fall asleep. Don't get lulled into indifference by the comforts of this world. Don't give up hope that God still does new and wonderful things and just decide to take a nap. Keep alert. Stay awake. Let me pray for us, and then we'll close our service in song. I'll give you a moment to pray as the Spirit would lead you, or maybe if you're not in Christ, consider God's offer of love and grace. The band will lead us when the time is right. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.